So shall we just start and then we'll just see who uh, will join us more. So Graham, um, how do you want to do this? Do you have some more to tell or well, no, <laughs> just hear all the questions? No, I'm really happy to, to, to develop any of the ideas or any of the ideas that I presented that, um, in, in ways that participants were interested in or happy to enter into dialogue on any of uh, on any related issue. So no, I, I haven't got anything specific. I told you everything I know in 15 minutes. So it's <laughs> <laughs> So is there anyone who wants to start with a question? Or a, or a, or a comment. It doesn't have to be a question. It can mm -hmm. also just be a, you know, comment in relation. I mean the the the, the book has got this broad theme around uh, whether how and what how and whether democracy can safeguard the future so if people just have general thoughts around that it's really interesting yeah Lucia yeah thanks I mean I already asked one question but since I didn't see any hands I'm going to ask another one yeah. <laughs> um, you know I'm really interested in the you um, you use the design principle of diversity I, I would like to hear a little bit more about that I mean in citizen assemblies it's usually sort of sortition and then that's it so but i'd like to hear a little bit more about what you know perhaps what what other measures um are there to make sure that um climate assemblies are diverse and that diverse um, uh, identities people perspectives pe people can really also participate because that yeah. can be very challenging yeah yeah so I'll, I'll say a couple of things about random selection and then and then other, other things so so first is um that um, citizens assemblies and other deliberative processes that use random selection are to my mind some of the they are the most diverse um, political institutions by design okay so I start everything I say which will be in a slightly more negative connotation well, I want to start from the position that these are the most these are the most diverse institutions you will find because of the because of the um the selection mechanism because of the random selection so so you can't find that diversity anywhere else you know it's just not it's in, in, a, in a democratic system you just don't don't see it anywhere um what i would say about it though is i, I think there is a i've i've done some work with migrant groups and um uh, refugee groups in the uk and they have um a, a couple of problems with citizens assemblies and the first is that is that they don't think that so what because you're trying to mirror the broader society when you get down to a small minority group you won't you know that you may or may not get one person in you may or may not um, ethnic minorities in the uk will be 15 to 16 percent but within that 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 assumes that that's a homogenous group and their concern is actually what you get with the ethnic minority um, representation will be people who are more well established within within the society. They are they are um, people who who are more familiar with institutions. And they were saying, you know, re refugee and migrant groups are not the kind of people who are going to respond to official letters from governments are inviting or from you know any. They might not, you know, they, they they just very often will be will be concerned about a letter from a from a government. You know, so um, there are certain groups. So these are, I, start, I stress again, these are the most diverse spaces, but there are aspects of the diversity that may be missing. And we, I haven't done the research, enough research on this, but my, the, 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 our insight, it does look as though the people from ethnic minorities tend to be in slightly higher social classes, okay? Slightly more educated. And that, you know, that's just the way that, that that's happening. So there, is, there are a group of people who we may not be getting to. And on something like climate change, that's really important because often they have refugee, they have experience from other countries, et cetera. And so the, the, the answer they say is, well, you, you just need to do much more targeted work. You know, you need to go through trusted intermediaries. You need to go through voluntary groups, et cetera, to generate a pool of people. And then you could, from that pool of people, you could then randomly select. But you're, you can't use your usual letter writing or telephoning because that won't, that won't work. The second thing they say is that actually having one person from a particular background isn't enough one of the things we've one of the things that feminist feminist um, social scientists have shown us is that you need a critical mass of people 
within a political body before their, that their ideas are taken seriously by everybody. Um, and, you know, citizens' assemblies try really hard in terms of, you know, providing evidence, et cetera, you know, but they, you break down into small tables. And if, if certain types of people aren't present on that table, you're, more, you're less likely to take their interests into consideration. So the argument then becomes, you need to radically oversample some sorts of people. And I already said on another, on another question, someone asked, should we, what do we do with younger people? And I was saying, well, there might be an argument for oversampling them. The problem there is, so I think there are reasons from, the, from a position of justice, I think there are reasons to radically oversample marginalized communities. But the problem is one of the ways that we sell and one of the ways that um, citizens assemblies are seen as legitimate is because they look like the broader population. My worry is that the mainstream population, you know, people like, you know, people who are more conservative will not accept an, an institution which has radically oversampled particular groups that actually its legitimacy will. So I think we're really, we're in a really difficult, I have no answer to this, no easy answer to this, but so from the position of ecological justice, you would want to oversample those people who are most vulnerable. From a position of sort of legitimacy, as in, as in popular legitimacy, pub, public legitimacy, that would be difficult because I think it would be very difficult to sell. So I think we're in a really, I, I don't have an answer, um, but I think it's a problem that we don't talk about enough. Do you have a response to that, Nico? The last thing. I have two questions about that. Um, first of all, do you have to tell the public that you're uh, oversampling? <laughs> because you, you, you tell them it's uh, by lottery, but you don't have to tell them uh, that to get an equal uh, participation that you have to uh, yeah put more people into the lottery. Yeah. Certain groups. I, I, get, I, would, I always get worried when we start to cover up our design principles. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, so I think I think that's problematic. <laughs> but yeah. But most people, um, when we did uh, the organization in uh, in Gema Bakel, um, when they knew it was by lottery. Um, that was enough. People stopped asking questions. And we did have uh, a lot of minority groups who weren't there or just a few people, just like you, you said. Um, but the people don't ask. So why tell them so they don't <laughs> get that? Well, you do, I mean, we do, we do publish all of our, um, for every mini public, you publish the you publish the, um, the demographics of the people who are there. And I think what would happen there, so we ran an assembly on Brexit. Uh, after the after UK had left, we ran a citizens assembly on Brexit, an independent assembly. And we made sure that we had half of the people who'd voted remain and half the people who voted leave to make sure that, and, and we knew that if we'd, if we'd had more of one side than the other, the other side would have complained about it. So there would have been, the, the right-wing media would have complained if there'd been too many uh, remainers and, vi and vice versa and i can tell you as soon as as soon as we start trying to gerrymander trying to actually create an assembly without telling people the the, the media the, I mean, particularly in the uk the right-wing media who are very anti-immigrant would be would find out that very quickly and would start would start publicizing that so i think it would undermine the process i'm afraid nico if we're going to do it you have to do it publicly and justify it i think yeah. you can justify it but i think it's quite a hard thing to do Okay, Thomas, I have a question. Yeah, I have another question also concerning um, legitimacy because um, in the Netherlands, we had uh, two years ago, we had a parliamentary commission on democratic renewal. Uh, there were a few political scientists and also uh, old politicians. And they were looking at options for the future of democracy. And they were also considering uh, citizen assemblies and many publics um, but what i noticed in their report is that like they looked at it for a year and these are like yeah quite prominent political scientists also and they 
like they took many publics and popular assemblies and opinion polls and they said all this participatory stuff uh, they, they all treated it as if it was one thing and they based their conclusions off of that by saying only these people will participate because that's something that happens in opinion polls or that happens um, so i'm wondering if even these commissions that are well informed that are uh, quite uh, progressive maybe uh, if even they uh, yeah all treat it as if it's one thing how do you think this legitimacy or this information about uh, this kind of democracy can can spread should it be through like more media attention or more committee work by government or more lobby or what is missing that right now it's not it doesn't seem to be possible so I've, I've had the exact experience, which is by, you know, I've, I've given evidence to a number of parliamentary committees in the UK and always there's a question from somebody saying, well, this is full of people who, 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 are, who, you know, climate assembly is full of people who are, who are climate activists. And you have to explain to them, no, it was done through random selection. And in fact, one of the questions is how much concern do you have about climate change, which means that we make sure we have people in there who aren't concerned right the way through to people who are very concerned. And sometimes they go, oh, really? You know, they, they just didn't know. Other times, mm -hmm. it's purely strategic action on the part of people who don't like public participation, who are trying to undermine the method. And it's trying to figure out which one of those two it is. So very often in the UK, there's a small group of Conservative MPs who know what a climate assembly is. They know what it is, but they keep saying it's full of activists because they're trying to delegitimise it. So you've got to figure out. So that's a different communication strategy for those two. There's a group of people who need to have a better understanding of this. And this is where things like the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies that I was talking about that, I've, that I'm working on with Bjorn is really important because we, we are working with policymakers who know nothing about climate assemblies to try and make, let, help them understand what they are and why they work. But it's also a matter of political strategy. We have to find a way of, under, of, of responding. We, we're a nice bunch of people. It's really, it's a real problem for us that we're such a nice bunch of people who believe in reasonableness and believe in reason dialogue, because sometimes some of the people who we're up against, they just don't act in that way at all. And we have to become much more savvy in being able to take down the people who are trying to take us down. <laughs> when, 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 it, when it's disinformation, you know, when it is tr just not true and, and harm must, and harm and other people in G1000 must have had this where, you know that the person you're talking to knows how this works, but they are using some popular misconception to undermine your process. And we've just got to we've just got to fight back. And I think I think fortunately, media literacy is, is increasing, not very fast, but it is increasing. Again, I say we, we often get very depressed about the state of, you know, there aren't that many assemblies in the world. You know, we should do more of this. Well, as I said, three or four years ago, I couldn't believe what is happening now. And there are debates happening in some UK newspapers, in some UK media outlets about citizens assemblies where media people actually understand what's going on. I've seen, you know, we've got, a, we've got a, this um, uh, documentary that Sarah was talking about. All of that sort of stuff is, is just raising the consciousness and raising the understanding. And get, there'll be a point when, you know, and, and there are more people in parliament now. I, when I used to talk to parliamentarians five years ago, there were maybe 10 people in parliament who knew what a citizens assembly are, was. Now there's 200, now 300, you know, it's much more like it's a common thing. So we've just got to fight back. We've just got to fight that disinformation. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, ben, you have a question. Yes, so hi, I'm uh, Ben from uh, G1000 Belgium. Um, so nice to meet you, first of all. I think yeah, you know nice my predecessor, Eve, very well. So uh, yeah, yeah, I know, yes, I know Eve very well. Yeah, yeah well, pleased to meet you. Um, my question was more or less about the, uh, the, the general theme of your lecture as in citizen assemblies being um, interesting tools to make long-term policies. And I was wondering, do you think specifically with this long-term uh, reach of the policies in mind, that it would be a good idea for citizens or practitioners or academics or whoever to strive for the fact that the mandate of citizen assemblies should increase? in the sense that, that the recommendations of these assemblies should be more binding, that parliament should, to some extent, 
uh, as far as they are capable to do so, actually enact the things that are proposed? Or do you think that this should, um, in, in any case, stay the prerogative of the um, of elected politicians, so of the representative representative democracy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this is interesting. This is where if you had Bjorn and I in the same room, Bjorn, who gave the first presentation, we would actually probably end up disagreeing with each other and fighting. Um, but, uh, he, we're in the same. We're, fortunately, everything's on the Internet at the moment, so we can't we can't physically uh, we can't physically attack each other. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I have I am. Um, I'm kind of uh, still haven't made my mind up about this. I'm very open to the idea that citizens assemblies make make decisions and one of the reasons I say that is because of my experience of what's happened with citizen assemblies so very often assemblies are established because the the politicians don't know what to do or are unable to act for whatever reason so they create a citizen a citizens assembly this isn't just climate assemblies this is citizens assemblies or other processes they, they, they create an assembly because they recognize that their, the system is dysfunctional and they need to put this question to a different kind of space. And so you have this deliberative space where people spend all that time and then they create these recommendations and then those recommendations are sent back to the dysfunctional political system, which surprise, surprise, doesn't deal with the, them very well because it's dysfunctional. So I, I have, I think, Philosophically, if I was just thinking about this in abstract, I would probably say I'm not sure and I would like to, I, I would probably say actually representatives should be the decision makers in our current system. But our representatives aren't functioning like it works in theory. They're functioning in, in a dysfunctional system. So I would get in, in, in philosophy, we, we often refer to a second best solution, which is the idea that we can't have the perfect solution because the, the system doesn't work that way. So I think given the dysfunction, given the dysfunctionalities of our system, I actually think these could be and should be decision making spaces because our, our system is so dysfunctional at the moment. If it was functioning as it should, then I would probably have a slightly different response to you. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, as I, as I mentioned in my lecture very briefly, that, that you necessarily give them decision making power. I think we have to, and it's something which I'd be interested to hear the G1000 people's thoughts on this and other, and other practitioners' thoughts is, we spent a lot of time thinking about the process. How do you involve citizens? How, how do we get them to generate recommendations? And not enough in how you embed them within the political system and how you think about impact. And I think there are things like giving, giving, the, um, giving the, uh, the, uh, an assembly veto powers, not necessarily decision-making powers, but being able to stop something or being able to delay something, or being able to cause, or being able to require something to happen within Parliament. I mean, we're, seeing, we're seeing this already with the, as I mentioned, you know, in Ostbelgian and others, you know, in Ostbelgian, there are, every time an assembly, it's a, requ it's a legal requirement that, a, that a, parli a, a joint parliamentary and government committee is established to respond to what comes out of the citizens' assembly. That's already beyond mm. <coughs> normal, normal practice. So I think we really need to spend as much time thinking about the transmission, the link between government, parliament, and these institutions as we have done on how they work. And, and people, you know, it's, it's people like myself who have spent a lot of time thinking about this have actually neglected that. And that has to be where we now do most of our work, because we actually know how these things work. We know how to make them run well. We don't, you know, we don't need another proof of concept. We know the concept works. The question is, how on earth do we embed them within our political system? And that's the big question for me. And it isn't just, it isn't just consultation or decision making. I think there's a range of different ways that we can imagine this. So, so that was a sort of hedging answer. But I, you know, yes, I can imagine them give, making decisions, but I also think I can imagine them doing other things as well. Yep, an interesting point. Thank you. No worries. Can I can I add something to it, to mm -hmm. Graham? Um, I don't know, Harm. This is my space. <laughs> <laughs> you, invi you invited me in uh, to to jo to give our opinion, so I will do that. Yeah, I know, I know. So I know. now, so now, from a practical point of view, so the question about mandate and what should we strive for was, of course, when we started back in 2014, this was the first issue we came uh, across, and. We, we started off with the, the second uh, G1000 to ask uh, for a mandate. 
because we think that there is, in the end, it's the ideal situation uh, that uh, uh, a G1000 or a citizens assembly is, is an ordinary instrument next to referendum and all other uh, uh, things we have in a democracy, in a, in a full grown democracy to come to conclusions and to make decisions. Uh, but what we found was that mentioning the mandate or asking for the mandate, the first thing what happened was that the door on, on the other side of the table closed immediately. Because uh, in the Dutch situation, and I don't know about uh, situations in other countries, but in the Dutch situations, it is so that um, uh, parliamentarians already have very, very little space for choosing, deciding, uh, putting things in place themselves. They are bound by regional agreements. They are bound by uh, uh, other party agreements. They are bound by uh, other uh, uh, city council agreements. And there is very little space for them uh, while they had the ambition to change the world as we have when they came in, uh, there is very little space left for them. And then we come across and we say, well, this little space you have, we want that from you. So I can imagine their reaction saying, okay, now uh, 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 no way that is going to happen. So we decided already back in 2014 to change strategy. And this is simply a matter of, that's why I call it a practicality. Uh, we said, okay, so we first have to establish, uh, uh, like Björn said, a deliberative culture. Uh, we have to get the society uh, used to uh, deliberative situations and to citizens' assemblies. And when we have uh, proven that we add value to the existing process, so it gives uh, parliamentarians extra space instead or less space, then we can uh, come forward and ask for a mandate and for institutionalization, etc. So this gave us uh, another, um, how do you call it, an uitdaging, and uh, 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 we had to, to find ways how we could influence political decision-making without a mandate. And this, uh, is, uh, this is what you call uh, putting uh, citizens' assemblies into a politic in the political uh, atmosphere and how do you connect them, etc. Well, Graham, I can tell you uh, the work we did since 2014 is only uh, 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 our attention is on that subject and the way we developed and the, cho the choices we made uh, are all, uh, you can pull them back to, to that uh, tension between how can we hold uh, the speciality of citizens together and uh, deliberative uh, in a coming to a conclusion in a deliberative way. So not giving up anything of that principle and that power. And on the other hand, embed this within the existing political system. And we are quite proud to uh, have some examples where we can, can show others that we succeeded in that uh, in a way even we didn't uh, expect to happen. Can I just add to that? I think you know G one thousand is a. You're going to like. You're going to record this, Han. You're going to. You're going to. You're going to put this on the uh, website. Recording you, is yeah, on, Graham. Yeah. So G one thousand is a really special institution in this space. Okay, because it differs from climate assemblies because it, it's a kind of. It has this idea of system in a room, and I think it has the value of having people who are decision makers in the in the discussion space. So it is, and that the creation of working groups and things like that, that that take this forward, that's actually very different from climate assemblies. So I think, I think, and that's one of the reasons I said we shouldn't think of climate assemblies as the only way of doing things. I think there are, I think climate assemblies are outperform G one thousands on certain things, and G one thousands outperform climate assemblies on certain things. You know, so they're they're just they're different beasts, both using random selection. So I I think it's really important that we recognise that actually harm and others have done that work you know a lot of work in think in design work in thinking about how you take ideas forward the second thing is just an empirical example that you may or may not know about is that in um poland uh, marcin gerwin who's a who's a citizens assembly activist there has persuaded 
uh, at least three different mayors to agree that they will implement any proposal that gets over 80% within 80% support within the within the assembly. So there is an example already of an empowered um, climate assembly, empowered citizens assembly, and it's happening in Poland at, mun at municipal level. And I think that's really I cannot even, and as you said, Tom, talking to politicians who don't like to give up power, I cannot understand how Martin has been so successful in persuading mayors to give up power. <laughs> That's been really impressive. <laughs> Nikki, you have a question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, me again. Um, so, Hello, Nikki. hi. <laughs> I'm very interested in um, what it is or how we could make citizens' assemblies or other forms of mini publics more long term oriented. So, one way could be to include children, uh, which we already talked about. And I think you mostly talk about using the diversity and deliberation. And I think that results in that the outcomes just happen to be more future oriented because there are more perspectives in the room. Uh, but I'm wondering if you have ideas of other design elements that could be used, for example, um, experts really specifically focusing on which, which ideas or which solutions to, for example, climate change, um, how they have different impacts on the future or um, in the kind of polling that is done beforehand or afterwards asking what people's perspectives is on future generations or do you have other design ideas on how to make a citizens assembly um, more likely to be fair to which future people yeah sure um just a couple of two or three things just throughout one is one is just in the mandate itself the task that is set so for example in in france they were asked to and also in in scotland they were asked to you know how do we deal with the, well they weren't asked how do we deal with the climate crisis but they had a particular phrasing but at the end of it it said in a way that is socially just in a way that respects justice um, they tended to think of justice in those as social justice between current generations but actually that could equally be framed so the question could be framed in that way immediately so you could as me you know citizens come into a room and the question they're asked is how so you know how do we achieve net zero by 2050 while respecting the interests of and respecting the interests of future generations or whatever you can so the very question can do that the second thing that happened in um in the in cork in the climate assembly uk which sarah organized is they had a panel of um, people talking about what justice means in relation to climate change and some of those talked about justice towards future generations so that was part of the evidence in the same way you were just talking about um, the third thing to do is to bring young people into the room as people who are going to who, who give evidence not just ha yeah, which is actually what happened in Scotland and I talked about that already then the, the last thing I'll talk about is is the use of scenarios um, there is a really interesting um, area of work which is basically you know um, participatory futures where you get people to participate in you you create future scenarios for people either using videos or using using sets you know creating rooms and things for people to get a sense to embed themselves in what it will feel like to have a certain type of future and in scotland um you can find the details on there if you, you can email me if you can't find them they they had four scenarios which were created by forum for the future which is a which is a, a think tank in the uk a sort of technologically a, a technological future a kind of community future and, and they use those to to help people imagine what a net zero society could look like what would it look like to actually live be embodied within one of those and so i think one of the things the people who work on participatory futures need to do some work with the people who work on citizens assemblies because they should be much more integrated with each other and i think that will also help with questions of systems change as well um, so so there's a whole whole variety of things there there's kind of the the, the, the mandate the ev the type of evidence and also the kind of shaping of that, you know, the, the, the sort of getting people to think creatively about futures. Um, so yeah, there's there's three for you. Um, is that, um, have you got ideas? Um, I think the ones you mentioned were my were okay. my idea. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Heiko. You have a question. Yes, I'm uh, Heiko. I'm, Hi Heiko. I'm uh, in. The Extinction Rebellion Netherlands, oh, right. coordinator for Dem Democratic Renewal. Um, I want to bring one more thing into the equation, and, that's, and that is time. 
And we've been campaigning and uh, lobbying for a climate assembly in the Netherlands together with many organizations that are also present here today. Um, and we've just had elections. And in the aftermath of the elections, I think climate assemblies has been put on the agenda successfully. Uh, but now we are getting into a moment that it, this formation of a new government uh, seems to take forever. <laughs> um, and then at the same time, we have the IPC reports coming out, uh, which just says time is, is up. Uh, time is up already sometime. Um, so my question is basically, that's a bit follow up, following up on also what Ben was saying, because uh, um, yeah, when we do have a climate assembly, the result is presented to a dysfunctional government. Um, so when, so my question is, when do you stop campaigning for a climate assembly and just start organizing one without the government, uh, or or do something else? What what are different things that you can do? Because it's simply taking too long. Yeah. At the moment. Yeah. Can I, can I just tell a, 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 a fantastic um, question? I'll just tell a little story because I, it, it, just before I answer your question is that I met, I can't remember the guy's name now. I met the guy who, who helped, who was one of the eight people who established it. The guy who, um, what's his name? It's gone for now. The, the organic farmer from the UK who was a, he came to talk to me in my room and he told me about his idea about Extinction Rebellion. And I told him it would never work. <laughs> So what what do I what do I know? You don't 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 listen to me. So anyway, so he um so um I think Extinction Rebellion has been amazing in terms of both you know its climate campaigning and also it's kind of not just arguing you know, about we need to deal with this, but but showing people a method for dealing with it as well. I think that's been really important for holding together a really interesting coalition of people. And I've done a lot of work um, with Extinction Rebellion in the UK. The first thing to say is that of course Extinction Rebellion is, is, is asking for a climate assembly, but it is, it is actually asking for an empowered climate assembly, um, you know, which is probably never going to be acceptable to a, to a politician, which is you know, the kind of harms point. So there's, there's always that difficulty as, a, as an Extinction Rebellion activist to sort of saying the kinds of assembly that a government will run probably won't be what Extinction Rebe exactly what Extinction Rebellion wants. The UK, activists have this problem the Scottish activists have had this problem you know that they want that the the kind of um the urgency issue is is really is really problematic but I want what I want to say is that even as even as the climate gets worse even as you know the emergency becomes more of an emergency day by day we still need to make hard decisions and so even if it comes to questions of radical adaptation or it continues questions of mitigation, governments are gonna to have to deal with these problems and they're gonna become even more difficult to deal with as the costs of them become more obvious. And that's where I think citizens assemblies may actually become a bit of a savior for representatives because actually they're gonna be a kind of space within which these really difficult decisions can be discussed and gives politicians cover to be able to make more radical action. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that will happen. What I'm saying is there is a kind of, there is a scenario here, which is a scenario of actually climate assemblies enable, give a space for these really difficult decisions to be made. And there's no question that in the coming years, it is going to be much more difficult for democracies to establish their legitimacy as, as climate impacts occur. And we are gonna need new ways of doing decision-making. The kinds of things we're going to have to do in relation to mitigation are really significant to people's lives and having citizens involved in that process is going to become critical and there are not many technologies for doing that and i think citizens assemblies are still going to be there so even though even though it is going to be too late in the sense of i don't believe that we can reach 1.5 degrees we're going to overshoot that doesn't mean we don't want to do democratic innovation because we're going to have to deal with a, a world that is heating we have to deal with really difficult decisions and those really difficult decisions are going to if we if we want to keep a democratic system functioning are going to have to find way new ways of doing things and i think climate assemblies are part of that part of that um, architecture so in terms of and then your second question your part the, the main part is should you do this yourself this is where i think you need to talk to the german people you need to talk to people like roman about their experience of running one independently because the germans are really far ahead of us you know that the german um, you know, as I said, they've run three of them independently. 
I think it is really, if you are going to run one, you need to make sure that you have a broad coalition because if it's just Extinction Rebellion, then it's going to be, you know, so many people will ignore it. So one of, one of the things in Germany that they've done really well is to get a broad coalition, including concern, including scientists who bought into this process. So your, your job is going to be kind of building that coalition who are willing to, who are multi, who, who bring different things to the table. So um, I think there comes a point when you do need to, you, you may need to organise one from within civil society, but it needs to be as independently organised as a government one would be. You know, you still need to be, have make sure that the governance structures are in place so that the, so that, you know, it isn't just Extinction Rebellion giving the information, it's kind of different perspectives and things, you know, so, so I, th I think the time for, I think the Germans have showed us what you can do with civil society led processes and G1000, I mean, initially started as a kind of civil society led process. It's much more, it's working much more closely to governments now, but I think there's always a role for that. So yeah, it's, it's definitely part of the strategy. How do other people here in this room think about the idea of, um, uh, taking such an initiative. Heiko, what do you think yourself, Roxanne? Well, <clears throat> we are having an in internal discussion about until what point. Um, yeah, because time is running out for taking the first steps. And I agree with Graham that there will be always room for a climate assembly on climate adaptation or uh, for decades to come, we will need that. But the point is, when do you start? There's something that needs to happen now, and when do you take that step? So, and one one of the things, um, Heiko, is certain, and I may I don't know if it's true in the Netherlands or not, but one of the things that happened in the UK is we've said, oh look, you know, they've run citizens assemblies in Canada, in in um, in um, in Ireland, in um, in um, Australia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And our politician said, oh, yeah, it works there, but it would never work here. So sometimes you actually have to do, you have to almost run one to show that it's possible to run one. You know, it's kind of, it's really frustrating. That there's always that exceptionalism. And some of your politicians may be saying, just wouldn't work in the Netherlands, which is just, I mean, I think the technical term is bollocks. It's rubbish. I think, I think <laughs> the, the biggest worry for Dutch politicians is because they know how it works and they know how participation works, but they are afraid it will work too good. Yeah, uh, yeah. So there is no doubt uh, uh, in our culture, giving our participation uh, culture, that uh, there is uh, hesitation about whether it will work or not. Okay. Uh, so that, that's yeah. the biggest problem. So it, what that, we don't is... have to, we don't, we, we might not forget uh, the German situation. Uh, what made the difference there, apart from uh, the gigantic uh, bottom-up organization of uh, mere, mere democracy, uh, was the decisive support from Wolfgang Schauble. When they got Schau Wolfgang Schauble on board, uh, from that point on, uh, things went uh, rolling. And yeah. this is the same problem we have here, because we are campaigning for uh, a, a Dutch G1000 on agriculture now, and uh, things are waiting for some of these officials uh, uh, wanting to step forward. So uh, it's important, this coalition building you mentioned, that is most important. Uh, there is no good time to start, so you better start now. Uh, uh, and don't wait and just uh, work on your way up until you get uh, uh, the means uh, and the support to do it and to show um, uh, what it is. Now I have the table or the... The, uh, I have to mention something else to, to react a, a, bit, a little bit late, Graham, but um, yes, you're right. When politicians are in an ugly position, uh, they tend to uh, agree with a citizens' assembly. Uh, we already uh, uh, had that situation in uh, staying, staying back a land two years ago. Uh, um, uh, and then we were asked to organize a G1000 climate assembly. You know that that exists also, Graham? Yes, <laughs> it exists. And at the moment we have uh, questions from two other uh, uh, local counties who want uh, a G1000 climate assembly as well. So maybe we could talk about, uh, with Knoka, about uh, uh, combining the two uh, yeah, mix, uh, philosophies. Mix, and, uh, mix methods, yeah. Mix methods, yes. Yeah. Ben. 
Yeah, I just quickly wanted to to jump on this point. Um, I think I agree with uh, Graham, but uh, like harm probably everyone else here that ideally there's a political mandate. If you for a climate assembly, I think if you do not, if you are not able to get it, then at least as Graham said, you need a very broad coalition. I think just talking from the, the Belgian perspective, I think if you were able to get business life and civil society in there as well, you would have a very broad support. And from that point onwards, both more conservative and more left-leaning governmental parties would be interested in hearing it. And just something that uh, is just coming from the top of my head, but the, the German people would know way better is, could it perhaps be an idea that if you organize something like this, that you do not make it the general climate assembly, but that you pick one specific theme out of it? Because then you can show how it works, how it is done. And if the government later discredits it, then they can organize something themselves about a more broader theme and they don't have to copy it and they can show off more like, ah, this is something that we did ourselves. Something that's coming from the top of actually, my head. Ben, I think you raise a really important question, which is actually what we've had so far with the climate assemblies. Apart from the Dutch one is slightly different and the Finnish jury is slightly different, but most climate assemblies you know, have this enormous remit, which is basically how do we deal with climate change? And I do, uh, the climate crisis, and I, I do worry that that's too much for one assembly to deal with. And in fact, they've all actually had to break down into smaller assemblies. So in fact, we've actually had, you know, the UK one had three working groups, the, the, um, the uh, French one had five, you know, so actually they, they almost like five separate assemblies at some point. And I do worry that, and, and this is what I'm saying about thinking about embedding climate assemblies as an ongoing process, because I think they, sh they may be deal better with really crunchy decisions that have to be made on the climate crisis at particular points rather than the whole agenda. Maybe you need one to set it, set it all off, I don't know, but having an assembly that is dealing with different aspects, that, that, is, that, that is a standing assembly, that membership changes over time, but is dealing with different aspects of the climate crisis as they emerge, I think would, to me, makes more sense than saying, how do we deal with the whole thing? But you know, that's- Michael, a, that, you have yeah. an extra question about that? Yeah, but that's one idea that keeps coming back to me is that because we've just had a huge flooding in the Netherlands, in the south of the Netherlands, but also hit Belgium and, uh, and in Germany. Yeah. And <clears throat> that you could take that as a topic because yeah. it is very, to talk about the water um, uh, and that make, that may, or maybe even talk about the water in a specific province or part of the country. Um, yeah, I think as that's a, right. as a start. And then yeah. you say, well, this is not uh, the climate assembly, but this is just yeah. one topic. And it's, it's one of the first 25. And uh, yeah. Because, yeah. It, because I think there, yeah, there's so many topics. So yeah. Yeah, I, I, that, think, I think, I think, I think we tend to, we tend to, there's a sort of fetish for one assembly that does everything. And I think that's, that may be problematic in the long run but the um certainly Martin, Martin Gerwin is very strong on the kind of you know breaking it down into smaller parts but it, but, it, but then that doesn't get you into questions of systems change no. if you if you if you do it in in bits you don't get the whole system change so it's yeah. exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Yes, so we did. We did. We did a. Uh, we did a, uh, a G1000 citizens assembly on uh, the future of uh, food uh, in uh, the region of uh, Brabant, and well, the problem there was it was very successful, but one of the first problems of the participants was that they uh, the half of their subjects were subjects which they couldn't deal with within the limits of the province. So yes, you can break down uh, the subject, but. Uh, citizens are, uh, if you let them deliberate themselves and let them lead themselves, they will soon get to the limits of your subject and go over it because uh, one of the big advantages of citizens speaking together is that they are tend not to uh, uh, take attention to the limits uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, uh, how, how the, in the government world. So they go over all uh, limits and think integral they they think and this is a quite a good quality of citizens assemblies so i wonder whether you should beforehand uh, put that in pieces uh, the, the better way in our vision the better way around is start at the top uh, have some uh, agree on some uh, uh, limits uh, as citizens 
and then work your way through those different subjects which uh, hang underneath that. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think that's, and also, you know, I remember um, I, I'm, I haven't done enough work to, to say, my hunch is, sorry, I haven't done enough systematic work at the moment. Yeah, if you look exactly. at the, if you look at the, there's, there's also importance with the mandate in the relation to the UK one and the French one were asked, how do we get to net zero or how do we get to a particular reduction? Whereas the Scottish one was asked, how should Scotland respond to the climate crisis? The Scottish one started asking questions about progress and asked, started asking questions about, should we use GDP and should we think about well-being? That was not brought up by the French one or the, or the UK one because their frame was, what policies do we need to reach net zero? So the yep. framing immediately has an impact on that kind of level of creative thinking. So I think I think you know this is, and we haven't done enough work. Again, this is another thing we haven't done enough work on. I think is 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 this sort of extent to which this framing can undermine. You know, a framing can undermine systems change thinking. So you know, there's, that would really, be interesting to put them next to each other and see hmm. what it does with the outcome. Of well, Canock is trying to do that yeah. at the moment, actually, to try and get some oh, insights on that. Would be very interesting. Nico, did you have a I question do. as well because you unmuted or? No, sorry. Heiko, you wanted to say. Yeah, <clears throat> well, on the topics, um, what I a bit miss in the uh, climate assembly discussion as a way of questioning things is the, the donut economy uh, from Kate Rayworth, because I mm. think that gives really nice mm. questions like how can a country thrive uh, uh, within the limits of the planet uh, and respecting uh, the rights of all people on the planet yeah. and the na nature of you see i think i think that that i don't know if they use kate's idea but that's that certain that way of thinking came up in the scottish assembly yeah. in a way that it didn't come up in the uk or the french one and you know so 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 the framing becomes incredibly important at that point so are there some more questions Lucia. Um, I had a question about um, this morning. Um, we heard about a model, uh, multi-stakeholder processes, uh, a model of deliberative democracy um, in which um, NGOs and companies uh, next to citizens are seen as um, political actors. Mm -hmm. And then one of your, um, the first design principle that you shared with us is this idea of independence, you said, from elections and from entrenched interests. So I'm, 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 I'm really interested to hear a bit more about that. So um, yeah, I, I see you nodding. So I, you get, I think, yeah yeah my, no, i think it's really interesting my my, my exploration yeah. yeah yeah no no sure sure and I, I you know harm and i have had discussions over the years about you know the you know the the, the the relative merits of kind of systems in a room versus citizens being able to sort of you know i i have some concerns about the extent to which citizens um are you know are able to um engage initially at least initially at the same with the same sort of uh, capacity as as people who are professionals, you know. They, but but you know, I've I've also seen in I've seen examples of people facilitating processes. Uh, I want to come and I have never seen the G one thousand action, so I definitely want to come over and see it. But I've seen examples where citizens have been provided with the support in order that they can do that. So um, a lot of this to me comes down to design and careful design, and it it's. If you bring um, certain actors like NGOs and um, politicians and public servants into a room, it depends how you how you structure that space. It depends what you ask them to do. It depends how you ask them to do it. Um, and I know from my experience that that's uh, something which is you know is amazingly powerful when you've got a group of citizens. I've had more difficult experiences when there are other stakeholders in there who are not willing to put their 
perspectives up for reflection, if you like. And I think that's the challenge. But, but I know enough from looking at the work of people of, of G1000 and looking at other processes that that is possible to do if you if you structure it well. And I think that's the question. And you know, you can run a, you can, there are lots of things at the moment being called citizens' assemblies, which are really terrible, really badly run. You know, people have got random selection, they're using table facilitation, but they just don't know how to do it, or they don't care, or they don't have enough money or experience. And so I think in the same way that you can get bad citizens' assemblies, you can get bad, good and bad multi-stakeholder engagement. And I would also say that I think that they probably have slightly different functions within the political system. There are times when it is really good to create a space which is citizen only. There's really, there's, there are times when it's really good to bring together different interests. And there may be that there are ways of, sync, of, of, of coordinating those two things as well. And, and, and so I think we just have to be really creative and imaginative. There isn't one model that's going to get us out of the, out of the mess we're in at the moment. We're going to need to experiment with all sorts of different models. I've thrown my hat into citizens' assemb uh, climate assemblies at the moment because it's very popular and there is a there is a policy window at the moment where politicians are willing to listen and where where activists are interested and where practitioners have got experience. And I think, OK, this is a moment to be talking about citizens' assemblies. In no way do I think citizens' assemblies are going to save the world. So, you know, so I, it's a, you know, may maybe um, maybe by the end of um, next year, I'll be in the. Uh, Knowledge Network on G1000, and we'll be kind of uh, doing that. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see you next year with the next uh, G1000 University. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when we meet in person, hopefully. hopefully and can can I just answer, yeah. As an answer to one of the other questions, which is about how do you, which was how do you make these change happen? And there was a really interesting thing that was done that Sarah was talking about, that she brought in some really important people to be part of the governance and experts within her, within her process. And they are now really advocates for climate assemblies because they've mm. seen it firsthand. So the chair of our climate committee, which is really so, important, the climate change committee, it was, was her expert lead. And he just, he just can't stop talking about climate assemblies now. And in the same way, Harm invited me to be part of his advisory group, the Agriculture G1000, so that he could use this opportunity to shape my thinking and make me realize that how good G1000, you know, these are the sorts of things you have to do. I mean, so my one was a joke, but you know, it's kind of, it's kind of really important. That it's a joke? Kind of, like, <laughs> I already booked you. <laughs> no, no, but I, what I meant was it, I already, I already think G1000 is a great, so it's not a problem. Yeah. So yeah, the, 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 but the, um, but that, that sort of strategic activity where we, you know, these are really, you know, there are, there are people who we can get on our side really quickly and really easily by bringing them into the process in some way. Is it helpful, Lucia, when I tell a little bit about how we deal with multi-stakeholders in, uh, in G1000? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I've, I've, heard a, I've heard a bit about it before, but sure, I'm, I'm very interested. I'm, I'm especially interested in the... Um, you know, but let me let me say uh, I'm still thinking about Heiko's question, right? So this is also why I'm trying to build a bit on that because I think that sometimes the ideal citizen assembly may not be feasible now, but I mm -hmm. think a more especially I think there's a, a quite a bit of political interest, right? There's there are quite mm -hmm. a few political, but maybe they're not they're not at the moment in a position to take a decision and say we go ahead, but but it, I think I'm, I'm looking for ways to engage them in this because I think that they're ready for it. It's just that the, the formation is getting in the yeah. way, right? So, so this is why I'm thinking, you know, we, we may have big, better um, possibilities uh, if we could think a bit more in the political system as well and, uh, and uh, what's happening there. Okay. So... To be more precise, um, the G1000 uh, has the principle of uh, the whole system in the room. And why is that? That is because our aim is community, our first aim is community building. So the whole democratic aspect of uh, formulating a political will and translate that in political decision making is a second order goal of what we are doing. 
first of all, we want to bring people together and uh, 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 give meaning again and identity again to communities. So that's why we use the open space principle of Harrison Owen, uh, uh, who thought about that. And we said, okay, let's have people in the room. And when they decide upon things for their own community, what logic is there when, they, when we do that in a new way, in a deliberative way, and when we have concluded, outside of the room, they have to fight for what they came, uh, what they decided upon together on the old fashioned way. So how practical is it to have the whole of the system in the room? So to have uh, the uh, government in the room, politicians and civil servants, because eventually we ask them uh, to look into and to take responsibility uh, for us, for the future of our community. So this role, partly they forgot about it or they make bad decisions. Okay, how good is it to have them in the room and to tell, it, to tell them that and to let them explain why they make this kind of foul decisions uh, and come to an understanding. And the same is as far as we are concerned uh, for employers. So, and mind the word we use, it is exactly employer and not stakeholder um, we think stakeholders, we, we keep them out of the room. Why is that? Stakeholders don't know what dialogue is. Stakeholders, uh, interest groups, uh, they are only made to defend their interests. So Graham, I agree with you. If you have uh, uh, bad, bad experiences with that, uh, we have them too. And we guard ourselves against them by leaving them out of the room. But this doesn't mean that professionals from interest organizations are well, well brought uh, bred uh, citizens uh, uh, who are quite capable and have a lot of knowledge we can use in the dialogue. So this is about how we work with the whole system in the room. We make differences and we keep interest groups on arm length, ask them to undersign a partner agreement uh, where they promise to keep themselves uh, to respect the process and to do something with the results of it. Uh, and we have, we I have to uh, interrupt no, you, Arm, because we only have yes. one minute left. So I want to have the last word sorry. to Graham. Maybe he wants to give us a last word. I've never been in a meeting with Harm where he doesn't have the last word. <laughs> so <laughs> that's exactly why I want to give it to you. So. <laughs> That was a cheeky. You never would have if Miriam wasn't present. So <laughs> he knows me. <laughs> no, this I, is I, the last minute, Graham. I know. I have. I have nothing. I have nothing to add. It's been really. I've just. I have so much fun talking with you all, and it's such, such an interesting area. And I, and I just want to stress again what I was saying before, which is, so much has shifted in this area in the last three or four years. We we're still, you know, still it's you know yeah. it's we're still a marginal practice, but it's a much more important practice than it was three or four years ago and we have to remember that that it's things have changed radically and so i you know i'm i don't know where it's going but i'm very excited yeah. even even in the face of the climate and ecological crisis this oh. is one of this is you've got to have some bright stars out yeah there. This exactly is one of it, you know. <laughs> thank you and so thank you thank to everybody you, for engaging it's Thanks. been really fun yeah thank okay. you so much so we'll see each other at uh 10 past now five past four at the uh, main session. Okay, see you all later. Thank you. Yes, see you.